Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> so we now have the, the closing plenary here now with Dr. Teresa Ting. Um, and usually the role of me now is trying to introduce the person who's speaking. But Teresa has said that she's already got something on her slides to introduce herself, so I'm a little bit redundant. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I will say we have a couple of email exchanges, uh, and at the end of one of the emails, Teresa works in Italy, and I did work in Italy, and Italy is a big part of my life. Uh, she wrote something in Italian, so I thought, ah, I'm going to reply the whole email in Italian. And it's a bit rusty because I don't use it all the time, but it's a good level. I'm C2 in, in Italian. Um, and I got a lovely email back. Saying, ah, tu italiano è molto bene. Still there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'd like to welcome Dr. Teresa Ting and thank her very much for coming and closing the, the conference for us today. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to this wonderful conference. Compliments for the organization, for all the talks, um, and giving me this terribly difficult role of closing, okay? Um, I tried to, I'm gonna try and insert names of talks I want, I've gone to and that, to try and tie it into what I had originally already planned also. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me here. Is there an echo? I feel like, no? Okay. Okay. Tell me, please, when I have 10 minutes left. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, here's the title, Dreaming, Learning, and Educating with the Brain in Mind, which is kind of the organ we need to cater to. Now, I'm going to suggest that since they are going to be videotaping this and recording it, and at the end of the photocopy, you will see that there is a URL, there's a Q QR code, blah, 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 that will go to this thing called Teresa's Stuff, okay? Um, for the next two weeks, I'm gonna be a little busy for family reasons, but after that, I'll be putting in stuff in my Teresa's Stuff, so you can link in there, okay? And therefore, um, and there you will find links to um, pieces of books, chapters of books that were published by Cambridge in Italy for CLIL, and um, of course, reference to Peter Mejisto's book where I helped a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be lots of references in there. So what I'm suggesting to you is just relax. Um, because your brain cannot take photos and listen and understand at the same time. Okay, that's lesson number one. So your students, if they're busy writing, writing, they're not listening to you. So please just turn off your cell phones, just relax, okay, and just listen. Um, but with your eyes open, please, okay? <laughs> and also my slides don't make any sense on their own, okay? They need a narrative, you'll see, okay? So don't even try to just take photos, okay? So just relax. So let's continue, let's start then. So here is the talk, dreaming with the brain in mind, and this is what I promise. Please take a read. Okay, so we need to enable learning and big dreams. So what you should be asking yourself is what does she know about the brain and what is, per, what is her perspective on Quill? Okay, because I'm gonna give you a strange perspective. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have, a, PhD, I have a, a degree in both biology and psychology. Because when I started studying biology, um, I started taking psychology classes. They were so much fun. I just kept taking more and more psychology classes. And towards the end, they said, you know, you can get a psychology degree too if you take one more course. I said, okay, I'll do that. And so then I didn't know what to do later, so I decided to get a PhD in neurobiology which is just the interface of biology and psychology, but the biological aspect. And when I did that, I studied rats and hamsters in vivo and in vitro, okay? And for example, I implanted electrodes in the brain of rats, i.e. on the left, and I studied motivation pathways. We're not gonna talk about motivation today, but 
the message today, very briefly, is motivation already exists in the brain. We don't need to invent the connections. The connection is there. But that's what we studied in rats using marijuana. Then we use slices of brains to study mechanisms, molecular mechanisms of memory. Because when you teach your students and they learn something, you have changed their brains anatomically, okay? For good and for bad, okay? So, um, and as a PhD student, I basically taught neuroanatomy to medical school students who then later on became MDs. They got rich and we continued being poor. Yeah, because we are research scientists. So anyways, and at the time when I was teaching neuroanatomy, just to tell you a little bit of how old I am, there was no MRI. So at the time, to, add, to teach neuroanatomy, we had to use um, brains, dissection, real dissection of real brains, and, um, and clinical symptoms. So we had to show students how to look at somebody clinically and say, oh, there's a tumor probably there, there's a tumor probably there. And hopefully when the surgeon goes in, there is, a, there is something there, okay? While today, you have the MRI. Any, any weird thing, you just stick the patient in the MRI and you find where the, brain, the lesion is, okay? It's just the opposite now. So that's what I did in my degree. And then I moved to Italy, that little red dot there, Cosenza, Calabria, for personal reasons. In Italia, the land of creativity, fashion, Ferraris, all that kind of stuff. And Italian academia is really flexible with the human resources. So they said, hey, you know about rats. That's great. Why don't you teach English? <laughs> okay. okay. So I said, okay. <laughs> okay. So I went, to, uh, I went to East Anglia and got an MA in education and learned that students are not like rats. They're not like cancer cells, darn it because they're not all the same, okay? So each learner is a little different. Too bad. Anyways, so that's uh, my uh, training. And when people ask me, don't you miss neuroscience? I said, no, because there's a huge relationship between that guy learning and this little guy motivated to press the lever because it's, it's all about learning. We are, we are, when we learn, we learn with our brain. Education acts on the brain. If you remember nothing else from today, remember that you are dealing with brains. You are, in the, you are working in neuroscience, applied neuroscience, okay? Now, so, so when I see a classroom like that, I see that. <laughs> that's what I see, okay? I don't know about you, but that's what I see. Okay, so let's start then. Okay, here we are. This is Francisco. <laughs> Francisco, do you know Francisco? Okay, anyway. why is Francisco learning English? Well, he has big dreams, and for which he needs a big job, and which probably calls for big English. Big dreams call for big language, okay? And what do we mean by that? To communicate his big ideas, Francisco must master academic complex English. Yeah, okay? So. Francisco's not that funny. Anyway, so, <laughs> so anyways, here, how do we do this? How do we take the students to big language? What do we mean by that? Let's first define that. Now, I went to the 2015 Leuven Conference on um, task-based language teaching I, I, for the first time in my life because I'm not in linguistics. So I met these big shots in uh, um, Rod Ellis, Bygate, and uh, Van den Kru I can't remember his name, but anyways, they were talking about, for Francisco to communicate his big ideas, he needs complex language. Okay, that's what they were talking about, these linguist people. And they were saying this, we have to increase task complexity, okay? And because if you have a complex task on the left, then you need to have, comp then, you, then you induce complex thinking, right? And as a result, you produce complex language. That's the thinking of this conference. So, for example, they gave an example. The example would be to take Dutch language learners, okay, immigrant um, language learners of Dutch, to go, they, the task is to go to a pharmacy and ask for an inexpensive um, painkiller, inexpensive painkiller. And that's the task, and that's a complex task. So the, they show that these uh, language learners went into the pharmacy and did that. Now, the, question, the problem is this. This is kind of an unsustainable complexity because 
I'm not sure the pharmacist would like you to go there more than five times maybe with your students, okay? So it's kind of unsustainable, that's one. Number two, is it complex enough, okay? Is the process complex enough? Does the language really reach academic? How many times do you have to do something about this experience to be academic? And at the end, can they actually produce complex output? Okay, we're talking about production, not reception, production. Okay, so those are the three things you have to think. And how long would it take you to after you go to the pharmacy? Then how many more lessons do you have to get to, to get them to produce that language to say, "Dear sir," okay, etc. Now, because we often put our learners in the shoes of complexity, we give them complex tasks. Imagine you were Donald Trump, okay, for example, okay, etc., etc. And we expect them to think complex thoughts, etc. And indeed, they do think complex thoughts. They do have complex thoughts. The problem is, what they produce is baby English. I don't know your experience, that's my experience. They produce baby English. And therefore, as a conclusion, these young adolescents who have complex thoughts, but only baby English, what they say, what they think is, English does not provide me the language I need to share my complex thinking. And darn it, why should I bother with English? So this is the problem here. So input is simulated age-appropriate complexity. Okay, we do that. But the output is baby English, and that's a dilemma. That's, I mean, that's a problem for us who teach English, because Francisco needs to get his job, remember? Okay, so there are those who can produce complex language, but are they the majority? From what types of family do they come, these students who can produce complex language? Where are they from? They're from families with high literacy, often, often. And that means there is diversity at that level, even with our learners in L1. You get that? Okay. Bilingual education, therefore, should not further this social economic diversity. I repeat that because who, okay, if they already are diverse in L1 because of different family backgrounds, they come and learn, they come and do schooling in English, what's happening? I have money to go to London, so my English is good, and I, get, I understand the content. You, who don't have the resources, are getting further behind, because you don't understand the content. So bilingual education must not further the social economic divide. Is that clear? Okay. So here I would like to just insert very quickly an introduction to um, a project that some of you know about and some of you are involved in is called, keep an eye on it please, because we just started it, it's called Attention to Diversity in Bilingual Education, let me see if I know how to use this, Adibe, okay, run by Marisa Cañado from the University of Yen and a bunch of CLIL people, okay. And anyway, so this is our purpose, we're, we're looking at how to, how to train teachers and how to design materials such that bilingual education does not further increase the diversity but brings learners together, okay? And hopefully you will see at the end of today that it can be done. Okay, so there we are. However, one good thing, no matter how diverse our social economic context, our brain, our learning organ, is more or less the same, okay, to start with. Now, let's, I'll show you why. I'll show you, I'll give you an example. Read, you're gonna read a text. You, you should read it in your best language. So if your best language is Spanish, you read the top one. If your best language is English, read the bottom one. Okay, ready? Take a read. Okay, you get the idea, okay? It's actually not a research done in Cambridge, okay? This is, this is actually, that's, a, that's fake news, okay? Um, but this works, okay? Now, why does it work? The brain, because the brain processes information immediately, looking for meaning. I'm talking about the most basic, basic brain that we have, looks for meaning immediately. What is that, why is that? Because when you're in the savanna, and there's this orange thing behind that bush there, and it's moving. You need to process information immediately, and you need to run. You don't wait to see, oh, is that a lion or is that a leopard? 
Okay, you don't wait, you just run. It could be a waste of your time and energy because you're running because it's just a dry bush. But nonetheless, it's better to run, okay? So that's why our brain processes information immediately and quite successfully if you know what you're looking for, okay? Let's continue. So processing information quickly is essential in the jungle, but it could be a problem in the classroom. Okay, let's see how. Here is Charlie and his teacher. They both speak English, okay? And so his teacher is explaining to him something about the heart. I numbered the different concepts there. Just take a quick look and read it to each other for 10 seconds, okay? Just to get an idea. You don't have to understand it. You just have to see that there are different, six different concepts, okay? Okay, so there's six little pieces of information. Okay, let's continue then. So even Charlie's brain processes information immediately, even Charlie, okay. So, and he's also looking for meaning. So when he hears his teacher say the heart has four chambers, what he's thinking is chambers. What do you mean? Chambers of what? Chamber music, okay? Chambers of torture, what chamber? What's this chamber thing? And then he gets, oh, he says, oh, it means area and the heart. That's new language. Then he said, oh, and the heart has four of these chambers. That's new content. So Charlie's really happy because he's gotten it. He's gotten both the content and the language. He, he got it. But by the time he got it, the teacher is saying this. Okay? What has he lost? He's lost half, more than half the lesson. So this is, this is the input that Charlie's getting because his brain processes information immediately. So he's processing the first piece of information. And that's normal. He's doing that because that's how our brain works. It's immediately processing for meaning. So he's busy processing for meaning while the teacher's going blah, 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 okay? So that's because he has to try and understand both the content and the language. All, all we learn, content, are based on lots of little concepts, okay? And all those concepts are embedded, where is that mark? Okay. All the concepts are embedded in language, okay? So to understand this thing about the heart, he has to understand both the concepts and the language. And of course, when he sees this, Charlie is not really happy. Now, I'm gonna just tell you real quickly a few very old research papers, okay? And I'm gonna mention Nicole and Sean, are they still here? Okay, they talked about reading academic EFL, and Robin, who is here, talked about Jennifer Jenkins, ELF, English as a Lingua Franca, and she, Jennifer Jenkins, in her book, Cite Bordeaux and Passeron, who in 1977 said, academic language is no one's mother tongue. You can write that down, <laughs> write that down. Academic language is no one's mother tongue. Actually, that's what students should have tattooed on their foreheads to remind us that academic language is no one's mother tongue. <laughs> Halliday and Martin in Writing Science, 1997. The language of science is alienating. The language of science is alienating. As a result, we can conclude from all this, academic language is already a foreign language even in L1 even in L1. Academic language turns our mother tongue into a foreign language. As a re but it's worse because when we're learning a foreign language, you know we don't understand it. But this is bad because, there's the te because we, are supposedly, we supposedly speak that language of instruction. Charlie's teacher is speaking to him in English and Charlie's not understanding. And that is really frustrating, okay? And that is the problem with a lot of education. Now, and this, this process, this whole thing, comes together to cause working memory overload. And you'll find all this information in the QR code stuff that I'll put in my stuff, okay? Now, let me tell you about working memory. Working memory very quickly. When information comes in, auditor, audio and visual information come into the brain, they, of course, go to the part of the brain that understands if you're, what you're listening to, that what you see is an apple or not a, not a monkey, etc. That's fine. That's the primary processing. But even more complex, it comes to the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain, and it starts processing to understand that information. And um, 
What happens is this. What we want all our teaching to do is go into long-term memory, because long-term memory has infinite capacity to store infinite amounts of knowledge and information. That's our long-term memory, okay? And that's where all our instruction should end up, okay? We hope. But it must all pass through working memory, okay? And the problem is this. So it goes from here to there. And to, for it to go into long-term memory, you have to have attention to the right information, you have to attend to it long enough, and you have to understand the information, and then it has a chance of going into long-term memory. The problem is this. Working memory has three limitations. It has limited capacity, limited duration, and volatile. Let me contextualize that. In the days when there were no cell phones, I may, maybe half, more than half of you don't even know what that means. But anyways, <laughs> the telephones were stuck to the wall, okay? They stuck to the wall. And imagine you had to, you had, you had an emergency water leak in the kitchen. What do you do? You run to the phone book. There were phone books back then. And you look up the number, okay? You find the plumber's number, and you run to the telephone stuck to the wall. Now, imagine on your way running to the telephone that's stuck to the wall, your teenage son says, hey, Ma, there's no water, so how about some pizza tonight? Boom, you forgot that number. You have to go back. That's volatile. Okay, that's volatile. Limited duration. It, it's the amount of time you get to run to the wall. Okay? And then, once you've dialed that number, poof, it's gone. Okay? Limited capacity. That phone number is no more back then than six units. No more than six units. The first two, co the first two numbers are maybe the area code or whatever, so you don't have to really remember that. So you remember four digits, okay? Nowadays, there's a cell phone. And that huge long number is not really easy to remember. You have to find a strategy, okay? So we're not talking about old stored information. We're not talking about phone number of your child, of your mother of your father. We're talking about information which is new and coming in, okay? And that has limited capacity, the working, working memory has limited capacity, limited duration, and it's volatile, okay? Now, so this type of input, total overload in working memory, totally overloaded, okay? Now, and this is called the blue screen of death, <laughs> and that is working memory overload. Okay, and that's what happens, okay? No one hears your scream, okay? Now, let's continue. And this is what it looks like, even in the mother tongue. Some teachers say that this is actually quite good. You can still see the shapes, okay? That's not bad at all. But this is not right. Why should learning, why should, what, do, you want a do you want a doctor that's done this much anatomy rather than this much? It's not right, okay? So, now, Clearly at upper secondary, after I've already explained how difficult learning is in L1, Clearly at upper secondary is even better because what we're doing is unknown complex content in an unfamiliar foreign language. That's called masochism, okay? <laughs> and that, that's, you know, who would want to do that? Would you like to do that? Would you like to learn something you don't know anything about in a foreign language that you don't understand? Nobody would like to do that. <laughs> But we are trying to do this to our poor young people, okay? So, that's what it is. And that is the reaction. Okay. Now, however, in Italian we say, quello che non ti ammazza ti fortifica. What doesn't kill you fortifies you. Okay. So let's see how it works, how quill can work. I'm going to mention Frank Smith, who was a writer in the 70s. The brain of a child is superbly sufficient efficient and instinctive. You read it. Go ahead and read it yourself. <laughs> okay. So, so voila. So we just have to shape our instructions such as fits into the brain. You know like those little games that children fit shapes into the brain? I have, a, I have a lesson that says, if the brain is shaped like a margarita, it's useless to force in triangles, okay? It wants margarita-shaped input. So that's what it is. So, shall we clill? Let's clill then. 
Let's clear our way to big language. Uh, listen carefully. This is what we're going to do. Don't move. But you have photocopies. And in those photocopies are a few tasks. Don't look. Don't move. See, she's moving. I, I knew that people would be moving. So don't move, please. Um, trust me. Trust me. And these more materials, I received the Eltons in 2013, and they're they were designed for 16-year-old learners from the I Italian Scientific Lyceum, okay? So according to the curriculum of the Italian science curriculum. And we're going to experience CLIL as potential learners, okay? And this is, this is learning proposed for 16-year-olds. We're going to do that, and then we're going to come back and become 26-year-olds and analyze the tasks, okay? Now, on, don't, don't look yet. <laughs> on the first page, you'll see this section here. And all that is there for is to show you. If you want to show this to a biology teacher, also show them the final ability, what students can do at the end of two hours of lessons. Okay? Because the first two tasks will look very simple. Okay? We start slow, but then really get to the curriculum. Okay? But I'm going to show you the first two tasks. Now, the last thing, and I told you this, is if you have already clilled the heart with me, because I've already used these materials many times with different messages, if you've already done this, don't go to sleep. I, what I want you to do is observe the other people doing the task. Okay? And I want you to be a good teacher and don't intervene. Give learners the opportunity to work. So if you are a biology teacher, which I don't think this audience has biology teachers, or if you've already done this CLIL, set of CLIL tasks already, don't intervene. Observe. Okay? If you haven't, then you're in the position of a learner. So there you go. Open up your photocopies now, and you can go to exercise one, and do exercise 1A and 1B now, very quickly. 1A and 1B. Work together if you want, work alone if you prefer, whatever you prefer. Just work, work, work. One A and one B. No, no jumping ahead. Just one A and one B. What are you doing? <laughs> one A and one B. <laughs> now, stress. Now, make the, after she's done, check with her. And one A and one B. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you did the opposite. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's good, I mean, that's it's good. Yeah, it's okay. Same, the same, the same purpose? Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, when, when, you're, when you're done, while we're waiting for everybody to finish, while you were waiting for everybody to finish, talk to each other about what we're doing here as language teachers. Talk to each other very quickly, okay? I think everybody's done. Okay, very good. No, no talking. Everybody's done. Okay. Except you guys. <laughs> Okay, now, stop, stop. So, 1A and 1B. I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about it. Volume off. Here. It's too loud. Can you turn it down, please? Thank you. Oh, it's not loud enough. So, closer? Okay. So, 1A and 1B, you're finished. Bravi. Now, 
I would like you to do exercise two. Please proceed to exercise two, ragazzi. You're still 16. Do you hear all that thinking going on? Okay, I hear that you have stopped thinking. So, let's continue. Exercise three, listen carefully. Listen before you move. It is not a test. It is not a test. It is still part of the learning process. It's a learning process that you're in, so you must look back and reread if you need to, okay? So, voila, do exercise three. It's not a test. People going back. Look at people going back. See? Okay. okay. See, and they're, they're discussing. They're discussing there. See there? No, they're discussing. Just Done? Okay. Okay. Now, let's continue. You're still 16 here, okay? Here we are. These are the four possibilities, and you should have chosen the first one. Sorry, these slides are the opposite, okay? So A, okay? Now, you're done being 16. You're now 26 again as a teacher. Did it work? <laughs> I agree, I wouldn't want to be 16, okay. So did it work? Now, before I show you, uh, this is the book in which uh, it's published in Spanish, and it already has the entire set of hard activities with the analysis step-by-step -step that I'm gonna give you now already done inside. And that I will also put in my Teresa's stuff, okay? So, now, so you'll find learning materials and analysis. Now, let's examine the learning outcomes after 15 minutes. I'm going to show you the learning outcomes after five of the 24 activities. You did only three, okay? So I have a few more activities. This is what some students wrote. And I went into a school. I don't know these students. I just chose a random student, okay? 
This is what this obviously girl wrote after 15 minutes. These are the errors. Oh, terrible. Look at that. Then two ventricle, no S. Terrible, terrible. Um, which without an H appears twice. Okay, it appears twice. That's because that's why there's a dotted dot rectangle because it's the second appearance of this terrible mistake. Okay, so very bad. Now, this is everything else that's correct. Everything. From the point of view of content and the point of view of language. Um, now, and I want to show you this. These are self-corrections. Look at that, symmetry. It was an I, and she self-corrected to a Y. Look at that, then and then. Italian learners have real problems with then and then, okay? And she self-corrected, larger than. Then, these things are things that don't exist in Italian. Hyphenated ad compound adjectives don't exist in Italian. And look at that. The input you got was left-right symmetry. Look what she wrote, left-right chambers. Mm -hmm. We don't really say that, okay, in scientific language, but she, she, she transferred, okay. Then this, two atria, yeah. two, and right atrium. She got that. Then interventricular septum, again, transfer of this hyphenated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Ability to use discipline appropriate language to communicate complex knowledge. This is productive disciplinary literacy. I went to wonderful talks about receptive. How do we get students to understand text? That's receptive. We're talking productive because Francisco needs to get a job. And he needs to sound intelligent and academic. Okay, so productive. Now, here we are. Thought question number one. Students produced big language. Did we have to fake a pharmacy? We didn't have to fake a pharmacy. We had to deal with an unhappy pharmacist. Also, thought question number two. Students produced big language. Was there any vocabulary teaching? Please talk to each other to see if there was any vocabulary teaching in these two texts. Talk to each other. One second <laughs> to decide. Was there any vocabulary teaching? Okay. Now, okay, this, this conversation should have been really short, should have just been simply no, okay? There was no vocabulary teaching. There was nothing vocabulary teaching about this. And students had not done the heart in Italian first. Because what more torturous can it be to do first the heart in Italian, which is boring, and do it again in English? No, they were ex novo, tabla, tabla rasa, no, no pre-teaching, okay? So there was no vocabulary teaching. And this is where my little guy, when he was little guy, okay? And my husband and I would say in code, what should we have for dinner tonight? Shall we get a PI, meaning pizza, okay? And we would just, shall we get a PI, you know, once in a while? And then one day, my husband came home with the PIs and Alex says, the PI's here. <laughs> because he got the context. He figured out what a PI was. It was no longer code for him, against him, you know, okay? And that's how we learn. Now, since many of you are elementary school teachers, I added in this here when I realized, I'm gonna show you examples of how CLIL pushes for productive disciplinary literacy in young children, okay, a project that we had. This is how it was. History of the Earth was divided by experts into 13 episodes. Okay, starting with the Big Bang. Okay, whoops, whoops, sorry about that. Starting with the Big Bang, okay, and et cetera. And basically, we, I produced all these very simple sketches, schematics, and they had, the students had to use a code. These were eight-year-olds. Let me spell eight-year-olds. They had to use this code, which was written in, in the numbers written in Word, and the colors written in Word, Okay, and there were 20 colors and 20 numbers. So it was light blue, brown orange, this kind of stuff, okay? So way more colors than their usual textbook. And they had to, so they had to color in these, 
things according to this code. And once they've colored in these things, of course, what you have then is something that's kind of informative. It tells you what, what's happening in these things, okay? So what they then had to do with this, these colored in um, diagrams was then to put in this kind of complex language. They had to look at, the look at their own drawings and decide which one belonged to which. Now I'm gonna make it bigger. For example, number one. Uh, please take a look at the first three. Very quickly, talk to each other if you want. Okay, I'm sorry, you probably didn't finish reading the three, but basically I just want to show you this. Okay, as you can see, it is not grammar sensitive. It is content sensitive. If I need to say, a long, long time ago, there was a simple past, a big explosion, there was a big explosion. The kids get it. You're not talking about now. The earth was very, very, very hot. Where is it? The earth was very, very, very hot. They understand. We're not talking about now. We're talking about the past. They, because they are mature enough, they have the cognitive maturity to know that this is the past. They don't need language, which is, they need the language to express the, the content, okay? And as a result, they were writing these things. This is what they wrote, and this is, of course, okay. I mean, I'm just showing you this to show you that they can do it, and they don't need vocabulary teaching, okay? Now, so big language for big dreams. So EFL instruction must push for output that is big language. And therefore, which, mean, which means, however, we must provide input that uses big language. Now I'm gonna show you this. This is from a book that we published with Annie Kelly. Look at this, this is about electrons in chemistry. This is like 16 year old chemistry. If you were rubidium, which energy level would your last electron occupy? that we're learning rubidium, they know the content, okay? Yeah, if you were, you, you're not. You, if you were, it's third conditional, unrealistic circumstances. Is, do we need more explaining of what, it, what the third conditional is for? Okay, and then look at here, okay? Um, where would your second to last electron be? The second to last. I mean, okay, we just inserted second to last because it was a moment to insert second to last. Yeah, because we don't have a lot of context, but we have a lot of second to last. It's hyphenated, and it's a way that's totally different from penultimate, okay? Penultimate is an English word, but if you say, this is my penultimate child, some people could say, well, I'm really sorry, okay? <laughs> because it's just not a word we use, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. Do you see, okay? So, given the complexity of the content, we can insert the language learning moment. So, CLIL departs from content, which is usually of age-appropriate complexity. If you're doing CLIL in upper secondary, the content is upper secondary, and you must do the content. We don't want a doctor that speaks a foreign language, but doesn't know where the, the heart is, okay? We want a doctor that knows his anatomy. As such, CLIL provides a naturally complex context for using complex language. And therefore, it gives us big language for big dreams. However, since academic language is already a challenge to learn, even in a one, to help students assimilate this foreign language, academic foreign language, we need to be particularly aware of how the brain likes this information or not. Okay, because otherwise we overload working memory. Therefore, here we are with Omer and Charlie. When the teacher has to do complex content in a foreign language, what the teacher thinks is, maybe the students don't understand me. They wouldn't understand you anyways in L1. But the teacher at least is thinking, maybe, maybe they don't understand me. Maybe I need a different way to teach without overloading their working memory. Okay, they may not think in working, mem working memory terms, work but now you will. Okay, so instead of speaking, instead of blabbing away, he transforms this challenging text into tasks. And these tasks are input tasks. 
And, however, we output tasks, too, for academic texts. And this is why CLIL explicitly cultivates students' ability to use a foreign language academically and in discipline-appropriate ways the type of foreign language that they will need to get jobs. Because if we don't, why bother? I call this the why bother criteria. If we're going to kill ourselves to be doing physics in English, why are we bothering if at the end of the day the, the student cannot produce academically appropriate language in English about the content? Why are we doing it? Let's just do it in Italian. Let's just do it in Spanish. It's the why bother criteria, okay? Now, so input are a bunch of tasks. And let's look at these tasks deeper. Exercise 1A and 1B. Let's look at these now. 1A and 1B. Look up here, because I'm sure you remember. Just quickly turn your pages, very quick. 1A and 1B. They are such easy, stupid grammar problems. Stupid, easy grammar problems. Why? Look, at, look up here now. Because content, at this point, they don't know anything about the content. So content, the cognitive load of content is very heavy. As a result, we need very stupid, easy language. Okay? So the content cognitive load is heavy, but the language cognitive load is light. Okay? So, in addition, 1A and 1B are very dumb problem-solving questions. Okay? Because when we're learning, when we have a problem to solve, people who like to do Sudoku and pass uh, crosswords, et cetera, understand this. We waste our time doing Sudokus for no reason, okay? Because it's a pleasure. We're solving a solvable problem. And when we solve a solvable problem, the brain likes it so much that there is pupillary dilation. I repeat, and you can't control that. When you are solving a solvable problem, your pupils dilate. Okay? And when you have found the solution, you have the aha moment. <laughs> and then your pupils constrict. It happens. You can't control it. This is how your brain works. What does that mean? That means your brain has been designed to solve solvable problems. Okay? And what were these stupid activities? Solving solvable problems. Okay? And however, if you produce, if you present something that there's the brain immediately says, no way. Your pupils immediately constrict, and there's no dilation, okay? Now, how much pupillary dilation is happening there? Okay, that's the question. Now, Dinosauro and Einstein, look at that. That is explicit academic language instruction. The instructions say, Dinosauro doesn't care about language. Einstein does, and he gets tens. Dino doesn't. The content is correct. Dino is not incorrect in his content. He's just bad with his language management. And here, it's just teaching them without telling them. Okay? And I was at a, a wonderful talk, and we were talking about instruction. If we expect them to produce academic language, we have to exemplify what is good and not what is not good academic language. But have them figure it out, et cetera, task it, simply because otherwise they may not understand. OK. What were the lang language learning objectives? Okay, awareness to academic register, exemplifying academic language, and raising awareness. So we're already cultivating literacy because we're raising awareness. We're telling the students, look, this is what you need to do to produce a ten, to get a ten, high grade, and this is, what, this is a weak text, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you the results and then we're done. Here you have this, but you can look at it on your way home. This is two months after the CLIL lessons, after two, the two hours of CLIL teaching, two months. This student was a student that the teachers didn't know knew any English, but she didn't speak at all. She was very shy, and she produced this text. And when, when Margarita showed me this text, I was like, did she copy? Because it was just perfect. And thank goodness for these, 
these slight errors here and there, it was really good, well structured, because she learned step by step by step by step. Okay. Now, even more impressive is this student. This student is called Consegna in Bianco, students that hand in blank papers. Okay, that's what Consegna in Bianco means. So this is a student's name, Consegna in Bianco. He reached 17 and he still was not writing properly. He would hand in tests that were blank. The reason he could do that, because in Calabria, I hate to say this on tape, but this is truth, in Calabria, where um, unemployment is very high, teachers hesitate to fail their students because if they fail their students, the next year there are no, not enough students to get a class going and they may lose their jobs. So if I had to choose, do I lose my job or do I send in the world 20 ignoramuses? I'll send into the world 20 ignoramuses. I mean, it's, it, I, I understand their choice. But that's why this Consegno in Bianco managed to reach the age of 17 writing nothing. Now, so when Margarita told them, write whatever you remember. She gave him nothing. Just, just write whatever you remember from the two, from the lessons of clear lessons two months after, two months after the lesson was done and it was not a test, she told him. Well, you will see on page, on page two, okay, right under the first activity, that is what Consegno in Bianco wrote. Okay, you're not gonna be able to read it, but if you look up here, I'll analyze it for you. Okay, basically you'll see a bunch of Scribbles. This is what he wrote. I'm translate. He wrote in Italian. Remember, there were only two lessons. Two lessons about the heart in English. He learned about it in English, but he wrote in Italian. But he wrote something. Okay. And this is what he wrote. He wrote first a title. He gave the thing a title. Margarita did not give him a title. He wrote in a title. Then, originally he wrote this. The first thing is, the heart is composed of four muscular chambers, blah, 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 and then he stopped here at the green period. But then he realized, oops, I need to introduce this better. So he wrote something here, and he said, move it up. And then he modified, because if you move the text up, you have to modify things, right? So he did that, and so that's what came out at the end. A topic sentence, okay? We didn't teach topic sentence explicitly. We just gave them tasks that illustrated topic sentences, okay, etc. Now, the output's in Italian, but it's output. Big language, that's productive academic literacy. In addition, all the green stuff that's underlined is, is information that was not in the learning materials. I repeat, was not in the learning materials. What that means is he probably understood enough to go and study and write about it because he also wrote about it in a very textbook-like language, okay? So he was excluded, now he's included. The output tax, uh, the input task was academic language in English. The output was text academic in mother tongue. So it's irrelevant what your colleagues in the mother tongue are doing. You do what you can in your classrooms for EFL learners. If you cultivate academic literacy, your students will benefit, not only in English, but also in L1. So finally, through, whoops. So through CLIL and EFL, you, get, you can have big language in L1 and also in English. So you, you have the possibility of providing a lot more than EFL. So big dreams call for big language. And here we are. I hoped I showed you how done well. It clearly does provide e TESOL educators the authentic complexity we need to naturally help students act to, uh, to cultivate the big language they need for achieving their big dreams. Here we are, this is my email. So, um, as I said, on your photocopies, you will have access to Teresa's stuff in about, at the end of the month, okay? At the end of the month, I'll put everything up there. By April Fool's Day, <laughs> you'll have access to all the stuff, okay? So, thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, I'm just going to say a few words and then we're going to have the raffle. Um, give you a couple of minutes. If you want to be in the raffle, you need to hand in your badges. <laughs> 